and this is up and we are live welcome to the podcast how you doing tonight thanks for being here thanks for having me yeah so just to give everyone you know an audience a little bit of a background and stuff and like i told you before we started i kind of caught up with you on a couple of different podcasts and you know i know you got a couple of books out and you got a youtube series and you're you know you're a coach and you you got started at a really early age just you yeah. know basically from your dad and kind of and i've even watched one of your interviews where you came out of you know, I guess you would come out during the night when everyone was left and get up on the stage and start, you know, speaking and practicing your, you know, your, uh, this, your skills, I guess, you know, yeah. is that kind of a good way, good place to start. Just going to give everyone a good background. Yeah. Look, I was born in Ghana, West Africa. My father's from Ghana. My mother's Japanese. I grew up in London, um, live in Los Angeles. So I feel like I'm from everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. Of course. And yeah, for me as a young boy, I was a very empathetic kid. So I felt people's um, pain very deeply. And there was always a part of me that wanted to alleviate suffering in some way, alleviate that pain. I didn't know what that would look like, but uh, I felt it really deeply. And, and so I remember for me, my first memories as a young kid was I was lost in the crowd and I saw this crippled woman. She picks up the sand that this man walks on, wipes it on her face and stands up call it a miracle. Um, week after week, I grew up seeing blind people see, deaf people hear, people stand up out of wheelchairs, stuff that you think this can't be real. Sure. Right? It's, it's, this is fake. And I just happened to be there. And so <clears throat> the man who sent she picked up and who was performing these miracles, this man was my father. Uh, so I got to witness firsthand wild stuff happen right in front of me. And, you know, the interesting thing is I didn't know that this was not normal. I always grew up thinking that this was the norm. I grew yeah. up thinking this was what everyone experienced. And, and so that was a blessing because I grew up with a sense of possibility. And so, yes, when I was a young boy, uh, I started speaking in my father's churches. My father built 300 churches when he, by the time I was already born, 300 churches in Ghana, West Africa, a huge church in London, hundreds of thousands of followers. And so uh, when I was eight, I started speaking in his churches, um, traveling with him as part of the time. When I was 14, I was ordained as a minister. And so we lived behind my father's church. <clears throat> we didn't have a lot of money. And so in the evenings, at night, I'd do my homework. And then around 9, 10 p.m., I'd sneak into my father's church, you know, open the door, put sure. the lights off in the pitch black, and I would... I would give seminars to the empty chairs, imagining and visualizing uh, people from around the world in my seminars, you know, in auditoriums. And and uh, for hours and hours every night, I would practice and hone my skills. And uh, a lot of people don't know, probably from the age 11, 12 till about 18, I I spoke uh, five, six times a day. Uh, Wow. Five, five, six times in a week yeah. uh, practicing. And so this for me was my passion. And so when I was ordained at 14, it was strange because I knew I wanted to help people, but I also knew that this was not my path. I also knew that this was not my destiny. My entire life was basically set out for me. My entire life was basically planned for me. Sure. And I just didn't have the courage to tell my father the truth. I didn't have the courage to look my father in the eyes and say, hey, I love you, but this is not this is not my path. Yeah. And nothing wrong with this, but this is not my path. I mean, my father was a very spiritual, mystical kind of guy, but the 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 sort of organized um religion part was just just wasn't my thing. And so it took me about four years to muster up the courage to um speak to my father. And when I was 18, I chose not to go to university. And this was a very pivotal moment in my life. Uh, I felt a calling to come to U the U.S. I felt the calling to come to California. I felt the calling to come to Southern California because when I was sneaking to my father's church, I sneak into his office. In his office, he had a bookshelf of literally a thousand self-help spiritual books. And as an eight, nine, ten-year-old kid, I started to uh, devour his self-help books, right. just trying to understand life and understand the nature of existence and reality and who am I and where am I from and what's the purpose of life. And I began reading everything from, you know, positive thinking, people like Norman Vincent Peale to Louise Hay to Tony Robbins to Deepak Chopra to, to Jim Rohn to Les Brown to the Eastern mystics of like Krishnamurti and Western mystics, people like Blavatsky, who had no idea at the time, but they were on my father's shelf. And so I really began immersing myself 
in understanding life. And when I was 18, I felt this calling to come to America because many of the authors I read about, they lived in California, the yeah. self-help authors. And so I thought I want to come and meet them. And I felt such a strong uh, calling. Like I felt this calling in my soul. And, you know, what's interesting is sometimes when your soul guides you, it doesn't always make sense. When your soul guides you, it's not always convenient. But I really believe through experience, when you follow your soul, when you follow your guidance, you will always end up in the right place at the right time with the right people, even though the path or the route that you take may not be the one you most expect. And so I said yes to the calling. And then I knew I needed to, to have that conversation, which was really challenging. And when I looked into my future, the expected path, I saw I could take over my father's operation organization. I could be successful. I could take it to the next level. But if I don't have myself, if I don't have my truth, if I don't have my integrity, what kind of success is that? You know, and 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 so it felt like a a, a betrayal of myself. And I realized if I begin to lie to myself now, I'm going to have to lie to myself for the rest of my life. Sure. And that that was too painful. And so at 18 I had the challenging conversation with my father um we didn't speak for two years which was again quite difficult and uh i left everything behind and at 18 a long story short i ended up winning a green card in the green card lottery and that's what enabled me to come to the us uh the american dream man and follow my dreams 800 dollars uh two suitcases knowing no one in the country and I'm, I'm profoundly grateful to to this country and America because I don't think there's many places a, a young kid without a college degree could have gone without knowing anyone and eight hundred dollars yeah. and made a life, you know. It's and a very so, bold uh, move. It's a very bold move. And yeah, I, I didn't think about it, you know. I really didn't think about. It. Maybe that was the blessing and the curse. I just didn't think, and uh, was just following following my soul more than anything. And I went and found teachers and mentors and folks I read about and studied with some of them, went to some of the seminars. And then I, then, then things really changed because I, I started traveling a little bit. I went to Israel, studied with a few rabbis. I went to Thailand, studied with a few monks. I ended up in India. And it was my time in India that really transformed my life. And I got a real sense of my purpose and my mission. And then I came back to the US again about 20 years ago and began working with people one-on-one, -on -one. no idea what the hell I was doing other than I just had this burning desire to help people. And before sure. coaching was a popular thing, I began working with people one-on-one -on -one. and one person came, another person came and things just honestly began evolving and growing and, and it went from one person to small groups, to larger groups, to larger groups, and then, you know, two best-selling books. And so that's the short version. I like it. And, and I'm glad you shared that with me. And it's really, I find it really great that you, you know, at a young age or even just, you know, right before 18, you know, you were drawn to those kind of self-help books and kind of reading people with already huge followings and already inspiring certain people and already kind of, you know, not had a manual for life, so to speak, but actually kind of laid out like maybe what worked for them and how they got out of their own way. And yep. you know, like what kind of what you just said, like, you know, you just let yourself go in a sense and just said, Hey, this is, where I need to go. And this is where I want to, where I think I want to be rather than just kind of listen to the actual social norms or maybe even what your dad may have had planned out for you. You know, yeah. you're ready to just take that on and it's very admirable. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like a lot of people are, are kind of afraid to get off the straight and narrow path just because of, you know, the unknowing. Yeah. Man, many of us were living what is expected of us. Many of us were living someone else's life. But yeah. what I found and what I realized is you can't be truly fulfilled and happy living someone else's life. You can't be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not. Sure. And I and I think, um, you know, from the moment we're born, we start getting conditioned. We're told by the world, this is who you should be. And this is who you are. We're told what to believe. Our parents start telling us, believe this. This is who you are. You know, society starts telling us, this is who you are. We go to school. We get indoctrinated and educated. This is who you are. This is what you need to believe. And then we you know, we go to university. This is who you are. This is what you believe. And, and, and we wonder why we're not happy. Because all of a sudden we realize, who, who, who the hell am I? I don't really know. And we're not really taught in school. Who you really are, we just get conditioned. And, you know, to be honest, not to get too out there, but 
I think much of society and media isn't interested in you knowing who you are, isn't interested in you knowing who you truly are. Because the more you know who you are, that you are a soul, that you are an infinite being, that there is a power, an energy, something magnificent inside you. You're not just this physical flesh, mind, body mechanism. The more you know who and what you truly are, the less you live in fear. And if you don't live in fear and you live in the power of your own truth, the less you can be controlled, the more powerful you are. But the less you know, who, you know, we're, we're totally, we're, we're constantly being conditioned. Like, oh, who you are is not enough. Who you are is not enough. Who you are is not advertising, advertising, TV, who you are is not enough. But if you just like, you know, drive this car and drink this beer and wear this underwear and drive, you know, have this, these socks and do this thing, then you're going to be enough by this. Thing. And so we're constantly being sold. Yeah. And, and, and so I think, you know, part of the, the path of life and the process of life is realizing who we are, awakening to what we are, remembering who we truly are and living that fully and freely as free humans in the world. Yeah. It's tough being, I think in a modern world today, to your point, it's tough for a person to be themselves and be authentic to themselves. It takes courage. Yeah. Just like you said. And then if you tend to step out, like we said, to step off the, you know, the regular path and you're all of a sudden you're almost, You know, crazy. Be, yeah, yeah, you're crazy. You're you're belittled for doing something different than you know, the social norm or what you know, like the media or whatever <clears> wants <throat> you to do. Or wear the certain clothes or listen to the yeah. certain music. You know, if you do something different, it's it's almost we're like conditioned different. to conform. Conditioned. We're conditioned to fit in. We're yeah. conditioned to to be a certain way, but it's killing us as human beings. It's making us miserable. It's making us depressed. It's not making us happy. And there's a reason we feel pain. To me, that pain that we feel as human beings, that's a sign. That's a signal that we are not truly alive, that we are actually not in alignment. That pain is there for a reason. you know. And so I think one of the things as human beings that keeps us stuck, one of the things as human beings that keeps us frozen, one of the things as human beings that keeps us, stops us from truly being fulfilled and happy are all the ways that we lie to ourselves. In many ways, we lie to ourselves and we don't even know that we're lying to ourselves because we're so conditioned and maybe disconnected from our truth. So we don't even know that we're lying to ourselves. We think that who we are is what we, who we are. And we think that what we're living is our truth, but yep. it's not. And so I think as human beings, if we want to begin the process of freeing ourselves, where do we start? Where can we start? I think one place where we can start is maybe looking at the lies we're telling ourselves is beginning to look at, okay, what lies am I telling myself? Maybe you're in a relationship and you know you're not in love and it's not right and it hasn't been right for five years, but but you're too afraid to tell the truth because you're afraid, you feel guilty. You're afraid of what people will think. You're afraid of society. You're afraid of your parents. You're afraid of, you know, disappointing someone, someone's how someone sees you. So you stay yeah. and it eats you up inside afraid to pursue your purpose. You're too afraid to pursue what you know you're here to do because people will think you're crazy because you're also scared of survival. And so I think where we can start is, look, there is no true freedom and transformation without truth. I believe truth is one of the most powerful things that we can own and acknowledge. And to me, this is power. And so what lies are you telling yourself? You have to want the truth more than you want what you have. And you have to want the truth more than you want what you think you want. To me, it's the truth that will set us free. But sometimes it it pisses us off. Sometimes it scares (laughs) us. But to me, this is the foundation of a happy life. To me, a happy life really isn't that complicated. It's, it's, it's simple, not always easy. It's, it's not always easy because we're conditioned, but it's simple. Feel the truth. Acknowledge the truth, accept the truth, speak the truth, live the truth, happy life. And if we dare to tell ourselves the truth, that's, I think, the place where life really begins. And and one thing I would just add is we often don't tell the truth because we're afraid of the consequences. For me, growing up, I was afraid of the consequence of, oh, shoot, if I tell the truth, I'm going to lose my father. If I tell the truth, I'm going to be alone. And so there's this fear of, if you know who I really am, my truth, you won't love me. And so we hide and we, we we pretend to be who we're not in order to get love, validation, to fit in, to conform, to be normal. 
but it makes us sick inside. It, it, it creates pain inside. And so what I invite people to do in the consideration of telling the truth, because it can be a little scary, like, oh, tell the truth, but uh, that might blow up my life. I tell people, take off the pressure of having to take any action. Take the pressure off of yourself of having to take any specific action and just acknowledge the truth. Okay, the truth might sound like, you know what? I'm not in love anymore. The truth might sound like, I hate my job. You don't have to leave your job. You don't have to break up. You don't have to divorce. But just acknowledge the truth. That gets you into relationship with what you really feel. And that begins a slow process inside, step by step. And that process is what starts transformation moving. And so what lies am I telling myself? What am I pretending to not know? Just acknowledge the truth. And then, you know, acknowledge the pain. Because when we lie to ourselves, it's painful. Yeah. When we lie to ourselves, it's meant to be painful. It's not meant to feel good. To the fact that we feel pain, which many of us do, is a sign that we're actually healthy. It's a sign that something is not working and, 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 and that pain is trying to get our attention. Pain is feedback. Pain is a gift. Pain is a blessing. Pain is your friend. Pain is trying to communicate something to you. But in our culture, we are conditioned to distract ourselves. You feel pain? Drink it away, smoke it exactly. away, drug it away, shop it away, yep. you know, social media away, sex it away, whatever it is, don't feel the pain. And so we keep, we continue perpetuating the lie, the disconnect that we're living. And so I think that if we're willing to acknowledge the pain and heed the message and the feedback of the pain, we can use the pain to start course correcting ourselves. When we don't acknowledge the truth, pain will manifest. Pain in the form of emotional pain, yes. depression, uh, Lack of energy, lack of inspiration. This is pain. Uh, physical, a physical ailment, a backache, a shoulder ache. We think it's random, but many of these things is our unconscious speaking to us. A, a, a disease, you know, a disease also in many ways is our body manifesting what we're not acknowledging and telling ourselves the truth about consciously. And so I think if we're willing to look at the message of the pain and use the pain as a way to bring ourselves back into alignment, this is where we can start to transform our lives yeah. you know and to your point again though i think a lot of the world is suffering in silence just because of what you just said that they're afraid to speak their minds and afraid of the consequences that will happen and just for personal example i was one of those people you know growing up you know i didn't really want to tell people what i really thought about things or what i really enjoyed doing just because of you know what might you know come of it afterwards where i'd you know be yeah critical for saying what i said or doing what i'm doing and and no, you know and that's a very very vague uh Kind of state, yeah, statement, but it's one of those things that was slowly over, over time after college, I started to learn that you know who cares, you know, you gotta let it go and you know almost let go of that ego and just what other people think and just that. And I think that's what I, I guess my next question is that you know there's a lot of the reason people can't do that is just because a lot of the world is very egotistical and you know what if like when we touched on earlier, the world seems to be very materialistic that you know you're not successful if you don't if you don't have a huge house with a, you know, a fence and fancy cars and jewelry and all that stuff. So I was afraid to <clears throat> take chances if you really want to pursue a certain passion or pursue mm -hmm. another alternate life of something you're truly passionate about that. Oh, like, Oh no, this won't be, you know, the perfect way of life. And then, you know, mom and pop might, you know, be upset with me and then my friends will hate me. And then what do I do? I can't, you know, I can't take that. So I guess, uh -huh. you know, can, can you be successful Without an ego, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at, maybe. Well, I, I think we also have to then maybe ask ourselves, what is success? Because if we're just living and chasing and seeking the mainstream validation of what we have been told success is, then we try to fit ourselves into that definition of success, yes. but that maybe that definition of success isn't right for us, then we will never be happy even if we become multi-billionaires. I work with many multi-billionaires. I work with some hugely successful people, and that doesn't mean they're happy. Sometimes when you get what you thought you wanted, you're actually unhappier because now you achieved what you thought you wanted, and you're still not freaking happy. And so when you're at least in the pursuit of the dream, you have the illusion that achieving it is going to be happy. But now when you get it, 
you have the Ferraris, you have the jet, you have the seven houses, you have the gazillion dollars, and you're still not happy. What reason do you have? What, what excuse do you have now? That's yeah. an even more depressing feeling. And, and so I think we have to ch- first challenge what is success? You know, in our world, yes, we are programmed in a very sort of ego driven model of success is the house, the car, the this, the that, the that, the that, the that. But is that success? Because here's the truth at the end of your life, you take nothing with you. Bill Gates will take nothing with, he won't even die in his underpants. Bill Gates won't even die with his sneakers. Bill Gates won't die with his favorite car. Elon Musk will not die with a pair of socks on. You will take nothing with you. When I was in Egypt and I went to Tutankhamun, I went to the pyramids. Then I I saw, okay, this is where Tutankhamun and all of the pharaohs were buried. Then I went to the the Cairo Museum. There's an entire floor of uh, Pharaoh King Tutankhamun's jewelry, gold, probably billions of dollars worth of it now. And I was walking around the museum going, he's dead. His stuff is here. We, we we will take nothing with us at the end of our lives. The only thing you and I will take with us is the degree to which we learned, we grew. The only thing we'll take with us is our consciousness, is our evolution. And so I think we have to shift our definition of success, maybe less about stuff. And we have to then take it to a deeper level of asking, well, who am I? Who am I really? Because if we don't know who we are truly, how will we know what success means to us? How will we know what success is for us if I don't know who I am? And so at the deepest level, we are souls. We incarnate into this human experience in these physical human bodies. It's just what is. We're souls. We incarnate. That's it. Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, atheist. But we're souls. We incarnate. We're in this human body. And to me, the way I see it as souls, we incarnate this human experience. And to me, life is really a university for our soul's evolution. And every experience, every situation, every relationship, everything we go through is part of the curriculum and learning for our soul's growth and evolution. And based on that perspective, I see life as the ultimate learning opportunity. And if that's the case, if we're here, so then we are here to grow and we are here to evolve. And if that's true, then perhaps success is the degree to which we learn the lessons, the degree to which we evolve, the degree to which we grow, the the degree to which we become our most authentic self, the degree to which we realize who we really are. To me, I think that's success because you could, someone could make a billion dollars and be freaking miserable, be Elvis, and then end up dead, right? Yes. You know, like, is that success? You're Elvis, and now you're you're, you're dead? You commit suicide? It's like ha, ha, Amy Wine's house. Is that success? I don't know, right? And, and so we have to question, who am I really? And I think part of success as a foundation is knowing who you are, yep. knowing who you are. Because when you know who you are, you know, that the stuff, the house, the car, none of that defines you. When you are chasing things outside of yourself to validate you, you will always be empty because all of that stuff is changing. Look at crypto. One moment crypto's up and next moment is gone. If you're defining yourself by, hey, I have a $2 million worth of crypto, Bitcoin, and it's gone, what happens then? Does that... Does that take away from your value, your worth, your your soul, your essence, your your validation? If you're identified with that as success, you're toast, you're finished. And so I think when we know who we are, it shifts the game that we are souls and we're here to evolve. And if you're like, like for instance, if you're someone who you're married 60 years, but you hate every moment. You hate the person you're with. And we all know people like that. You hate the person you're with. You're completely miserable. Maybe you're cheating on your wife, having affairs, having mistresses, but you're married. Is that success? I don't know if that's six, if that's six, but we're, we're, we're together. Is that success? Well, you're together, but you're cheating. You're miserable. You're both miserable. 
uh, how, how successful is that? And so to me, success isn't a function of form. To me, success is the degree to which you perhaps you're growing, you're evolving, you're learning the lessons. And maybe it's possible to not achieve a certain outcome, but grow and learn and evolve. Is success selling out your soul, selling out your soul, selling out your integrity to make money, hating yourself and having money, but you sold yourself completely? Is that success? And so we have to question, and that's why I say perhaps success is not about the surface level, not about the stuff, not about the, the, the tangible outcomes. Perhaps success is the degree to which you you learned the lessons, you grew, you evolved, you became your authentic self, you were true to yourself, you lived in your integrity, and you and, and you you honored yourself because in life, there's two things you have. You have reputation and you have character. Reputation is what everybody thinks about you. Okay. You, we do this podcast. Let's say five, 15 million people listen to this episode. Great. We're sure. going to have 15 million reputations. Someone's going to love you. Someone, I love Chris. I hate Chris. I love Coop. That coots to this. He's to that. He's not this. He's amazing. He's that. We're going to have 50 million reputation. But you got one character. Character is at the end of the day, in the middle of the night, when you look yourself in the mirror, are you at peace? Do you like who you are? Do you like what you see? Do you respect yourself? Can you say, yeah, I'm happy to be me. I'm happy that I'm me, with or without the zillions of dollars, with or without the Lamborghini. I'm happy that I'm myself. Because if you can do that when no one is around, not on social media, not on TikTok, not on Facebook, not on Instagram, but just you, yourself, in the mirror, I like you. I like myself. To me, that's success. That's peace when you actually respect who you are. And then from that, see, the thing, from that place of respect, yeah, doesn't mean you can't create and have stuff. In fact, I think you're much more likely to manifest and be powerful in the world when you actually respect yourself. You're much more likely to create results in the world when you respect yourself. Right. And so a new definition of success, I think, is necessary. You know, a new way of seeing, a new paradigm to me, that's the key. That was very powerful stuff right there, man. I appreciate you explaining that to me because it's one of those things too, like, you know, there's been some battles and and through a lot of people's life that they couldn't go yeah. into here and just say, hey, that I am happy with who I am and who I planned out to be. And that, you know, did life go the way that I had planned? But it's normally it doesn't, but that's okay. But I still, at the end of the day, I can acknowledge who I am and I'm enjoy it. And, you know, and just like, you know, there's other people out there who are probably screaming at the mics right now that, oh yeah, the success is only if you're buying Rolexes and Lamborghinis and stuff. Nothing like wrong with, look, look, nothing wrong with yeah, it, man. I, I mean, I agree. Rolex, like, and I, I wish, I wish radical. I'm not like anti stuff, you know? Right. And, 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 but the thing is, here's the thing. You have that Rolex. There's only a certain amount of time that that Rolex is going to give you that feeling. Sure. There's, there's going to come a moment, right, when, I don't know, a month, two months, three months, a year, after some period of time, it's just going to be another thing on your wrist. Nothing wrong with it, but it's going to buy the Lamborghini. Enjoy it. I love cars. I've had a Lamborghini. I've been there. I've done it. They're amazing. I love it. Um, but there comes a moment where it, it's just it's just the car at the end of the day. Right. So 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 here's the thing that I, I think I'm gonna explain it this way. We sometimes get caught up in a subject object pursuit that we make something outside of ourselves the object and the reason for our happiness. We will always be slaves. We will never be free. I'm happy 
because I have this iPhone. Oh, now I'm happy. I'm happy because I'm driving my this this Bugatti. Oh, now I now I'm happy. And so we wait for the thing, and now we're making the thing responsible for our happiness. It's and so because we achieve the thing, if you can, if people can understand this, this understanding will free you. You achieve the thing, you felt a moment of happiness. Bugatti, I feel so happy. The Rolex, wow. You know, uh, Patek Philippe, amazing. I'm so happy. You think that the object is the source of your happiness, mm. but it's not. And because you think, you as in you, me, all of us, because we think that the object is the source of our happiness, because we felt a moment of happiness, we now get in an addictive chase to get more of it. Yes. Because I now want another hit. I now want another hit. Got to get another watch. Got to get another meal. Got to get another bill. Got to, nothing wrong. But realize it's not the source of your happiness. That leads to a never-ending path, a never-ending game, a never-ending chase. What you have to realize is this, and this is a spiritual thing that I'm trying to like demystify. When you achieve let's pick a thing when you get the ferrari sure you're like ah oh, i'm happy ah for a moment here's what happens for that moment you're like ah you exhale there's a moment of happiness you you mistakenly think it's the ferrari but what actually happens in that moment is you as an ego you as an ego Stop chasing because you achieved it. You get what I'm saying? Uh, you, I'm as an ego, stop chasing the thing. Right. So, what actually unfolded the happiness was not the Ferrari, was actually the cessation, the stopping of your constant seeking, the stopping of your constant. You actually stopped running for a moment. It's not the Ferrari that's making you happy. It's the stopping for a moment that is allowing you to access the innate happiness that is your nature. Because you stopped being in activity sure. and you stopped chasing and you just, ah, that allowed you to get in touch with the happiness that was actually already present inside of you. It was always there, but we're not in touch with it because we're constantly running, chasing the thing that we think is going to make us happy. We achieve the thing, then we stop. We think it's the thing, but it's the stopping. It's the cessation of activity. And so happiness is actually your natural state. It's your nature. And if you look at a child, a baby, a baby giggles. Why does baby giggle? Happy. Does it freaking giggle? Why? Because, <laughs> happy. because happiness is its freaking nature. You, you didn't give a baby, you give a baby an iPhone. Yeah, it's going to giggle. You give a baby a freaking uh, a fake iPhone. It's going to giggle. You give a baby a toy Ferrari. Eh, you give a baby <laughs> a real Ferrari. There's no difference. You give a baby a a real $4 million Bugatti and you give a baby a trash piece of wrapping of a protein bar, <laughs> it's, it, it's going to giggle because innately happiness is its nature and it's our nature. And as we start realizing, oh, jeez, it's not the thing that makes me happy. Happiness is what I am. Then we can actually shift it and stop seeking for the thing to make us happy and actually get in touch, start focusing back inside and getting in touch with the happiness that we are. And when we actually get in touch with the happiness that we are, then we live from that place. We're not seeking to get happiness or success. We're actually living from that place. Then we're happy right now. And likely when you're happy right now, you're going to be more productive. Probably you're going to be more successful. Yeah. If you start living the way you want to, kind of what we've been talking about 
this whole yeah. podcast, you know, just finding your happiness and getting in touch with yourself and just locking out all the mechanisms where people tell you how you should be acting and what you should be doing. And exactly. Just to go live your life and just. There's uh, no shortage, man. There's no shortage of people that will tell you or think they know how you should be living. Think they know what you should be doing. Exactly. But the thing, the thing is, most of those people are freaking miserable. Yes. You know, most of those people themselves are not happy. Most of those people themselves are not fulfilled. Most of those people themselves are not, you know, fulfilled in their marriages and relationships. And so be aware, you know, be aware. You don't, you don't, ultimately in life, I say you don't owe anybody anything. It's your life. At At the end of the day, at the end of your life, you will have to look yourself in the mirror and say, did I live? Fully. Yes. Do I, and, and do I have regrets? Because dad won't be there. Mom won't be there. You are the one that will have to answer to you. And success is when you can look yourself in the mirror today or at the end of your life and say, I don't have any regrets. Because ultimately, you're going to have to answer to yourself. Do you think at the end of people's life, they have their own version of heaven and that's where the consciousness goes? Or what do you think? What are your views? What are your thoughts? Um, You know, two things. I don't know what happens when we die. I don't think any honest person can honestly say they actually know for a fact what happens when they die because they haven't freaking died yet. You know, And, and so... Maybe we have theories. I'm not saying those theories may not be, but the truth is, I don't know what happens when we die. What I do know is we're here right now. And so for me, heaven or hell, maybe there's a heaven or hell when we die. It's possible. Everything's possible. But to me, heaven or hell can be right here, right now. How many times have you, uh, uh, how many times have we sat around on a couch and we've ruminated in our minds creating all sorts of scenarios about tomorrow when next year and COVID and then, and forget dying. You're in hell right now. It's a state of mind. It's a state of consciousness. So I would say heaven or hell is a state of consciousness in a given moment based on where your focus is, based on your attention is. And you don't have to die to go there. Many times I have lived for many years in the past in hell within myself. Forget dying. By focusing on Comparing myself to other people by focusing on all the things I'm not, by focusing on all the ways I'm not enough, by focusing on all the potential scenarios and negative future fantasies and disasters that might happen that haven't happened yet. Yes. That's hell. I know how that goes for sure. I've been there and just, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, it, it, it's just one of those things that it is so easy to do that nowadays. It's because, so easy. Yeah. And it it's, and it's like the mind just wants to bring up more negative things than it does positive for whatever reason that is. And I don't know if that's just human psychology or what, but just even, you know, even going through the holidays, you know, just so we just got through that. Just, you know, some people it's hell and some people it's great, but this, there's our times. It's like you're saying just random moments that you might just, your mind just wants to go somewhere else or somebody sparks a certain statement that's comparing you to somebody else, like your cousin, your brother, your sister, whatever. And then like, oh, like and you actually think you're doing pretty well in life. And then all of a sudden, yeah. it's like, no, it's like bring you back down a peg, you know? And, yeah. but, and it seems like, you know, in your newest book, like The Magic of Surrender, I mean, this is kind of like you learn to let things go like that. And, you know, and that's where you find the courage to, you know, be your own way and do your own thing. And, you know, don't worry about if, you know, religion or politics come up during Christmas and New Year's Eve with your family that, you know, you stick the way that, you know, you be yourself and, and that you're good and that's good with you. Right. At the end of the day, like we've been saying during this whole podcast, rather than just trying to impress people who don't really care about you. And yeah. So just living your, I think at the end of the day, what matters is the loving, you know, here's the thing, whenever you're expanding, whenever, look, not everyone's going to love you and that's okay. And, and and life is not a popularity contest. Life is not high school. It's not a popularity contest. And, you know, whenever you are following your purpose, whenever you are up to big stuff in life, at least big for you, whenever you're following your dream, there will be people that try to bring you down. This is normal. This is part of the path. Because here's the thing. 
sometimes, and some of these people will be your best friends, so-called best friends, so-called family, because really where it's coming from is it's well-intentioned because it's coming from fear. It's coming from fear. Let me repeat, it's coming from fear. And if you understand what is driving it, you won't even take it personally anymore because they're pooping you in your parade is not really about you. It reveals more about them than it does about you. So here you are reaching for your goals. Here you are, in your case, doing a podcast, bettering yourself, reaching for your next level, expanding, being great. And maybe someone you love, someone you care for, someone close to you, like, who do you think you are? Who do you, you know, blah, 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 blah. Why do you, you know, why can't you just be like so-and-so? Why do you have to want this? Why do you have to want, why, do you, why can't you be happy? Why? You? And, and so what happens is, it's easier for that person to poop on your parade and it's easier for that person to bring you down because when they bring you down, they don't have to take responsibility to raise themselves up. To bring you down is also a way from them to not lose you because they're deeply afraid of, wow, if you take off, if you go to that next level, maybe your connection won't be the same. And so many times it's easier for people to bring you down because when you reach for your potential, it reflects and shows people where and how they themselves are not reaching for their potential. Because if you and, and your friends are groveling in the mud together, everything's cool. But the moment you say, well, no, no, I'm going to reach for the light. I'm going to reach for my greatness. All of a sudden, that shows them where they're not. And sometimes it's uncomfortable for people to look at you, seeing you reach for the light and the fact that they're too afraid to or the fact that they're not. And so it's just more convenient to try to bring you down so that, so that they don't have to take responsibility to reach, reach up themselves. And so in that sense, it's not personal. And to be honest, it's okay. You have to start becoming comfortable and realizing that in the path of growth and evolution, we talked about life is growth, about growth and evolution. Yes. You're going to lose people. You're going to lose people. As you reach your goals, you're going to lose people. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just growth and evolution. You don't wear, we don't wear the same socks that we wore when we were seven. Sure. We don't wear the same underpants we wore when we were three. We don't, you know, play with the same toys that we play with when we were, you know, 10 years old. We grow and evolve. And so it's natural that as you grow and evolve, certain people might come with you. Everyone is invited, but certain people won't come with you. So one of the things we have to start making peace with and becoming okay with is not everybody will grow with you and, and evolve with you and go to that next level with you. And it's okay. Everyone has a different destiny. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... It's that's hard. great. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> that's, you know, it's one of those things. Is I wish more people would understand that, and and it was one of these things. Like again, you know, one of the lessons I've learned throughout my life that took me a while to learn. But once you learn that, okay, they're not really trying to, you know, it's like crabs in a bucket, kind of what you're saying. That you know, every time a crab is trying to get out of a bucket, the other crabs are pulling it back down with it, right? But it's not really. Oh, did you freeze on me? uh Oh. Oh, you're back. Sorry, my internet froze for a second. Okay, sorry. But yeah, I was just talking about just that, you know, in order to get inspired, you know, you try to go out on a limb and start a podcast and, you know, go get extra schooling in college and do all of these things. But, you know, the expression crabs in a bucket where, you know, you go to do these things and better yourself, people try to pull you back down. And that's what crabs are. They won't let the crabs get out of the bucket for whatever reason. But but people mean well thoroughly. And that's what's kind yeah. of it is once, once you accept that and that's what took me a while to accept i think and just knowing that okay they're not really out to get me but they're kind of trying to help me but it's their own way of helping me and, and doing it they're the best way that they can but they just don't <clears throat> maybe quite seen it the way i see it but yeah. but once you accept that and you learn okay it's okay you know learn to accept it learn how like it like you said at the end of the day i know how i am i know how things are going for me and i can accept that and nice. and i wish more people you know could understand that rather than just getting you know random information they see off social media and random i don't know just ra random tweets that they see this mis misinformation just know that listen to people like you and 
putting things yeah. in perspective the way that you are. It's just like, oh, wait, okay, this guy's on to something here. And, you know, and, and like, you know, and I always feel like life is all about momentum right now and that we're just keep going and going and we're not really stopping and taking a chance to actually realize, you know, where, where are we in life and mm-hmm. where am, am I successful and what does success mean to me? And, you know, mm-hmm. and, and even ask yourself, oh, am I, am I happy? You know, mm-hmm. and just because so many people are in this the rat race, I guess, and just trying to exceed the expectations that people have brought onto them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard for people. And I get it. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's just one of those things that if you really are feeling upset about something and you want to change, then there's ways out there to do it. And, like yourself, you're one of those people you can, yeah, yeah, get information from and figure out. Okay, you know where where can I start at in life? And if you know maybe where if if somebody is going through something terrible, I mean, what would be one of the first things you would help them out with and or tell them to change or tell them to look at? I mean, or just to well, first you know, number one, themselves. number one, take full responsibility for where you're at. It's number one, take full responsibility for where you're at. Um, you can't change something unless you own it, take responsibility, accept it, and give up being a victim. That's that's one thing I would say. Take full responsibility. Number two, tell the truth to yourself about where you're at. What's not working? What's not aligned? What is the truth that you need to tell yourself? I'm not happy. I'm miserable. I'm this. I'm that. Tell the truth. Those are some places I think people can start for sure. Number three, I would invite people to to get mentors so that you can get guidance from people that have already been to where you want. Number four, I'd invite people to really make sure you have a plan and you take action. Many times people say, oh, I'm not where I'm at, but I've done everything. I've done everything possible. I've done everything. Honestly, I've done everything. Chris, every-. And I ask them, well, what have you done? They tell me like two things, <laughs> two things. I'm like, two things. Like, yeah. like it, maybe if you said I did 200 things, but I've done two, th- I made two phone calls. That's not everything. And so I think many times people don't, give 100% or they don't do their best. Sometimes we don't give 100% and give everything as a self-protective mechanism because if I don't give everything, then then I can always know that when it doesn't work out, if it doesn't work out, that there's the cushion of knowing I didn't give everything so that it, it, it kind of like buffers the feeling of rejection. Like I didn't give everything, but if I gave everything, maybe it could have worked. And so... Uh, it can sometimes seem to be more painful. Like if you really give everything and it doesn't work, then then it can seem painful. But if you don't give everything, you'll never really know what's possible. And so I would say start there. Great. Well, Coot, thanks for being here. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I know if, if, if you want people to find you or if you want to plug anything and cool. all your books and all that good stuff, feel free to do that right now. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, the conversation. Yes, um, The Magic of Surrender book. People can find it on Amazon. Uh, the, the the paperback is available. Uh, it's a roadmap to help people uh, live, to let go of what's not working and really tap into their greatness and live their true purpose and calling. Um, check it out. Written with a, a lot of love. Uh, my main website, kootblackson.com, K-U-T-E, B-L-A-C-K-S-O-N, kootblackson.com. And for those that were maybe inspired by the conversation today, uh, twice a year I do an event in Bali. This year I'm doing my final events in Bali. It's a 12-day transformational experiential immersion seminar training where uh, I help you free yourself of the past, connect with your true power, and catapult you forward into living your destiny. 12 days with me in Bali. The next event is July the 28th to August the 8th. We're going to dive deep. Uh, if you're someone you feel a, you feel and know that you're here for a bigger reason than yourself and you're ready to manifest your purpose, www.boundlessblissbali. That's boundlessblissbali.com. Great. Well, again, thank you for being here. You're very motivating and very inspiring. I'm and I'm glad we were able to sit down and have a little chat together. So I appreciate you a lot. Thank you. Appreciate you. Right here, folks. See you.